Welcome to the Council on Strategic Risks Podcast Network, where we discuss anticipating, analyzing, and addressing core systemic risks to security in the 21st century. I'm your host, Dr. Shetha Chakraborty. Pakistan is the focus of our inaugural episode in this series, and I'm thrilled to have two fantastic guests with me today. I will be conversing with Elizabeth Threlkeld, a fellow and deputy director of the South Asia program at the Stimson Center. Before joining Stimson, she served as a foreign service officer with the U.S. Department of State in Pakistan and Mexico. Elizabeth previously worked in the Kurdish region of northern Iraq, where she managed development interventions on gender-based violence and ethno-sectarian reconciliation. She also has expertise on China, Taiwan, and Turkey, and has received several awards for her work, including the Department of State Superior Honor Award. Also with us today is Neil Bhatia, who is an Associate Fellow for the Energy, Economics, and Security Program at the Center for a New American Security. His work focuses on the geopolitics of energy, climate change, and tools of economic statecraft. Prior to joining CNAS, he was the Climate and Diplomacy Fellow at the Center for Climate and Security. His writing has appeared in Foreign Policy, World Politics Review, GRIST, The National Interest, and The Week. So both of you have extremely unique bios, and we'll delve deeper into your unique experiences. But let's start by each of you explaining to our listeners exactly why Pakistan is so critical to regional and international security. Elizabeth, let's start with you. Sure. So I think um, first and foremost, in my mind, Pakistan is a nuclear weapons state. Um, It borders a regional rival that is also a nuclear weapons state. Um, And there's a history of conflict between the two. It's also crucial to developments going on with the the conflict in Afghanistan. Um, Dynamics with China play into Pakistan through the China-Pakistan Economic Corridor. Pakistan itself has a population of over 200 million people. So there are a lot of intersections that I think we see in terms of of regional international security in Pakistan. Yeah, I would just add from, I think, a human security perspective of that 200 million people, a vast majority are under the age of 30. So it's a rising generation, um, long been a dynamic country, both in South Asia and the wider um, Islamic world. So trends that occur there do have ripple effects for uh, the region and the wider world. So this is a country we definitely need to pay attention to. So Elizabeth, you've actually served as a U.S. Foreign Service officer in Pakistan. Can you kick us off uh, by telling us a little bit about your experience there? Sure. So I had the privilege to serve at the U.S. Embassy in Islamabad and the Consulate General in Peshawar from October 2014 to November 2016, so fairly recently. Um, Before I went to Pakistan, I learned Pashto, and that was my main focus when I was in Pakistan. So I was a political and economic officer focused mainly on Khyber Bakhtunwa province in the northwest and also what were then known as the federally administered tribal areas along the border with Afghanistan. I also had the opportunity to travel to and do some reporting on Pashtun communities in Karachi and throughout Sindh and and in Balochistan as well. So I was very fortunate to have um, a fairly full picture um, of the country. I should say, certainly, you know, as a diplomat, um, we were operating under security restrictions. It was largely the elite of the country that I was able to access. So I want to be very careful and, and not claim that, you know, I had a full view of Pakistan. But I think from the, the viewpoint that I did have, it was an interesting time to be there. So when I arrived, the military operations are via Zub. Um, was taking place in the Western tribal regions. This was the Pakistan military's largely successful attempt to rein in militancy um, in the Western border regions. There was also the Peshawar Army public school attack, um, unfortunately took place while I was there. Um, There were cross-border attacks in both Uri and Patankot. So those two years when I was on the ground um, provided a really interesting viewpoint into a variety of different conflict dynamics in Pakistan. Um, which obviously we were quite focused on in the embassy, um, but you also get a sense of of the extent to which they both do and don't affect just ordinary life in Pakistan. And that's really interesting to come at from somebody who is coming at it from representing the United States. And then, Neil, you've also done work as f- coming from the United States, but also looking at it from 
the relationship in South Asia between Pakistan and India. So talk a little bit about the work you did on um, putting climate change on the agenda for India and Pakistan's relations. You had specifically written that preventative action coordinated between India and Pakistan is needed. Otherwise, there is a risk that projects meant to ameliorate climate change will, if they proceed on separate tracks, only exacerbate tensions between the two nations. So tell us a little bit more about that from the relationship standpoint between Pakistan and India. Yeah, so this piece that I wrote back in 2015, sort of in the run up to the Paris process was to try to get a sense of how to break what I think is the zero sum philosophy that dominates so much of India and Pakistan relations where for each side, if the other is seen as benefiting, it um, it's sort of assumed that it's coming at their expense. And you see this in the security realm, you see this in the economic development realm. Um, you see this with both countries involvement with Afghanistan, with both countries relationship with the United States. And I had sort of come to this issue from what would be considered a traditional security lens, looking at militancy, looking at the stability of the nuclear equation on the subcontinent, and then trying to project that into some future trends of which the climate impacts would be a large part. Um, and I think you've, you're talking about the India-Pakistan relationship. Specifically, it's mostly about water security um, in the sense in, in both countries that what has hitherto been uh, a shared resource and managed more or less effectively and on a practical basis has become much more politicized and much more securitized over the past couple of years. And the worry among some in the analytic, uh, analytical community that if those trends continue you might actually see a military conflict based entirely on the perception that um, they need to physically control a natural resource at the expense of their neighbor. Yeah, that's really interesting. And we're going to get into some of the water security issues um, further on in this conversation because there's plenty of other risks in addition to water as, as a restricted resource. But I'm curious, since you wrote this article, has there been much progress on the subject? Uh, no, my, like most things in India-Pakistan relations, they've gotten worse since um, I wrote that piece. That was May 2015, which might have seemed like a high watermark in terms of the bilateral relationship. Since then, um, as Elizabeth mentioned, there's been um, a series of cross-border military attacks. Pakistani or Kashmiri militants have attacked Indian security forces in Kashmir. The most recent... Um, sort of incident coming back in beginning, the beginning of this year in 2019, once again, focusing the world's attention on this extremely volatile relationship. And you saw, I think, in this specific incident, the idea that a, a terrorist attack and the sort of retaliation on the Indian side and the defense on the Pakistani side also bringing in this sort of discourse about resource security that it, and this, especially on the Indian side, where you have their water minister talking about, you know, you know, it's one thing to, to for us to share water with the Pakistanis when things are great and our relationship is, you know, if not in the best shape, then at least based on mutual respect. Uh, but that's not what the case is now. And so, you know, why should we be letting this resource go when we can control more of it? And that's something that um, Prime Minister Modi is also uh, referenced previously. You know, Elizabeth mentioned the URI attack in 2016. Among the many comments that Modi made about that attack specifically, he you know, gave the very lapidary phrase, blood and water can't flow together, which I think is sort of a harbinger of what we would consider the worst case scenario in this relationship that as the militancy rises, so does the desire to punish one side or the other using natural resources. Sure. And I have a lot more questions. I'm sure listeners really want to know some more about exactly what's going on and how water is being used to really put pressure on um, Pakistan by India and more details and some of the history there, too, because this is definitely not a new tactic. But I'm curious how the Pakistani people are affected by these these different 
politics and then the real reality of what's happening on the ground. So Elizabeth, based on your time there, how do how do the Pakistani people tend to hen- handle these types of pressures? And how do these how how can these restricted resources be used uh, tactically like this? It's because of extreme events. Can you talk a little bit about why this is even an issue in the in the region? Sure. So I think throughout my time in Pakistan, I was continually impressed by the resilience of the Pakistani people to, um, in this case specifically, climate related risk and extreme events. Um, Thinking back to the floods that took place in 2010, um, impacted around 20 million people over um, the full country. There was mass displacement, uh, loss of life and, and livelihoods. But the extent to which the areas that were impacted by those floods have bounced back since then is remarkable and I think speaks to that resilience um, of the people of Pakistan. But that should not be taken for granted. Um, And I think particularly to the extent that pressures from climate change, given the importance of agriculture to so many in Pakistan, that has the potential to, in combination also with ongoing economic um, pressures that we're seeing from inflation um, and other issues that average farmers, for example, on the ground are dealing with, as soon as water scarcity becomes more of a challenge, as soon as rising temperatures um, really become more acute, that has the potential to push some communities potentially past the breaking point. Um, I saw just in the news yesterday, um, there's a march of some 1,500 farmers that have headed north from the Indus Delta in Sindh province, seeking some sort of support um, to end water shortages and erosion of their crops. They're finding themselves unable to actually support the livelihoods that they've um, traditionally had in the south of Sindh province. And so I think we should be aware of those incidences and and wary of potential longer term, broader trends that they might represent. Um, Resiliency can only go so far um, and we might be pushing that that point in Pakistan right now. And what does the current state, uh, how has it been affected by increased flooding, which you were first talking about. So last year's monsoon season was considered the worst in decades. So you were just talking about the current situation. How How is the increasing monsoon and flooding also impacting the current situation? What does that mean for the farmers' livelihoods? Um, I think one of the things that has changed is the timing of when the monsoon rains will come. Um, you'll see glacier Um, Glacial melting as well is playing into these dynamics. And so depending on obviously the magnitude of the monsoon, but also when the rains come and where, that can be the difference between a farmer being able to support themselves and their family in a given year and having a crop that's wiped out or or doesn't end up producing um, based on expectations. And so I think flooding in particular, looking back for example, again, at what happened in 2010, on the governance side, you also see when there are these sort of um, mass events that tax an already stretched local government capacity to respond, there's also the risk that those sorts of events create a vacuum for um, non-governmental organizations that are affiliated with militant groups have taken advantage of and come to fill um, and further kind of ingratiating themselves and filling that space within local communities. And so there are knock on effects to these sorts of um, climate related incidences, be it floods, for example, in this case, that are also important to to take into consideration. Sure. And we know from the work of the Council on Strategic Risk that this is actually a tale that has been replicated across different regions. And we'll see that as we continue this series, that this is a lot of these factors uh, when found together are going to produce these sort of results that you just described. So what does this mean? Thank you for giving us the what this looks like for people on the ground and for the communities. Neil, what does this mean for Pakistan's governance capabilities? Are you concerned that these kinds of extreme events could overwhelm governance? And how can we think about governance and institutions becoming more resilient? Will they be able to? Uh, 
Yeah, I, I, just to echo, I think what Elizabeth said, I'd be very concerned about um, the sort of pre-existing lack of capacity being stretched or potentially broken by climate impacts. And I think in the case of Pakistan, it's important to sort of disaggregate what we mean by governance. I mean, there's what there's what the civilian government in Islamabad is capable of doing. There's what the military in Pakistan is capable of doing. There's great variation in what the provinces themselves can do on their own. And because of recent changes in Pakistan's constitution, a lot of the responsibilities that we would sort of group under climate change mitigation and adaptation are the responsibilities of those provinces, some of which are more well-resourced than than others. And then as Elizabeth also mentioned, there's what we consider uh, parallel governance structures that can, in a vacuum, um, sort of fill fill that void and um, compete, I think, for the loyalty of ordinary Pakistanis when it comes to demonstrating who's capable of dealing with a crisis and and who isn't. And, you know, my, I think the greatest concern of most analysts in this case is the Jamaat Dawa or whatever they're calling themselves this week, the (laughs) sort of Pakistani um, militancy slash charity who's, um, you know, members were responsible for the Mumbai terrorist attacks back in 2008. Um, But within Pakistan, they um, sort of operate across a couple of, a bunch of different sectors that are important for disaster relief. You know, they run their own hospitals, their own ambulance corps. Um, They're really good at food distribution, at at doing all the things that the Pakistani government should be able to do for itself, but isn't. So the, the message being sent is not a great one. And sort of the question of how to proceed from here becomes significantly more important. Um, the government of Imran Khan, you know, to its credit, you know, has has staffed the climate change ministry with some capable people. And um, I think in the most recent budget for this year, it sort of plussed up the, the funding for all of this. But, you know, they're trying to affect change in what's a very calcified political and socioeconomic context. Um, You know, Pakistani elites are very good at taking care of themselves. They've had less of a good track record in terms of taking care of the the poorest among them. And so this becomes an essential security question for the United States and the international community. And when we talk about those who really are the crossfire here. I mean, you can't help but think about Kashmir. And so we can't ignore the role Kashmir is going to play in India and Pakistan's strife over this region as it relates to future climate stressors. So you talked a little bit about water security in the beginning of this conversation. What is it about how is India now politicizing the region and using water as a as a tactic for politics here? Yeah, so I think it's important, to, as you mentioned before, to go back to the, the history of this. Um, you know, as Elizabeth mentioned, in addition to the monsoon rains, one of the most important sources of fresh water for uh, human consumption and irrigation are those glacial river flows out of the Himalayas, which when India and Pakistan were one country, you know, that was fine. Um, people could deal. Um, partition comes around suddenly you have two different antagonistic nations sharing one important river system. And for the first, you know, 20 years or so, um, not really being all that good at um, dealing with one. Another on this, um, eventually the World Bank steps in as sort of a mediator and cobbles together what ever since the 1960s has been a pretty effective treaty arrangement for sharing those waters. It, you know, delimits what can and can't be built um, on different tributaries of the Indus. And uh, there's a commission of both countries and independent experts that meets to hash all these things out. And through all the wars and sort of little skirmishes that both countries have fought, that system has been fairly stable. And I think it's only been in the past, you know, maybe three or four years where it's, you've seen the strain. Um, you've seen the Modi government in particular say, you know, as I referenced before, on a couple different occasions that maybe we should reconsider the Indus Waters Treaty 
as a whole. And on some occasions, they've sort of, you know, done things within the treaty that they're allowed to do, which they haven't done in previously about, you know, they've sort of let water go to Pakistan that they didn't absolutely have to. And they've held that back in response to specific acts of militancy. Now, that's allowed under the treaty, but obviously you can imagine the hackles that's raised in Pakistan when this happens. And they've repeated the threat, um, you know, when there's been mass casualty incidents that they can pretty reliably trace back to Kashmiri separatists or jihadists that they know operate in Pakistan or what have you. Um, so it raises the question, when we get to the next crisis, is that crisis the one that's going to break the Indus Waters Treaty? And are we going to see the first sort of water war of the 21st century? Um, you know, the political science literature will tell you in the vast majority of cases where you have two countries that have a dispute over a water resource, it's more likely to drive cooperation than conflict. Um, but the one like butt case they all mention where it actually could fall apart is India, Pakistan, because the nature of the race pre existing relationship is is so bad for all the reasons that we've mentioned. Yeah. So these threats to weaponize water and breaking down of the treaty, how are we going to see maybe a change? What you just described maybe won't be the case because because of these extreme trends, weather trends that we're seeing. Is that going to Elizabeth? I'm curious about your thoughts. Is it going to maybe um, despite, you know, uh, what Neil just mentioned about this being a unique situation between the two countries, perhaps it'll drive some sort of cooperation on the issue because we're in such a unique period of time. Yeah, I think it's it's definitely a point for consideration. Um, and Neil's piece in Foreign Policy spoke to this as well, that there's actually a great deal of room for useful interaction between the two sides and exchange between the two sides on exactly this issue on climate change, because it is perceived to be less sensitive than some of the more overtly military dialogues that um, have been cut off between the two sides. Um, and so to the extent that there is both a demand from both sides by virtue of these extreme events that we are seeing, um, there is the possibility for climate related dialogue to be useful, not just within the, the climate space, but also more broadly in terms of um, building bridges between the two sides. All that said, I think um, you also have to recognize that there are extreme tensions in the relationship and the extent to which Indian government officials do raise the potential of cutting off the flow of water, um, that is going to securitize the climate dialogue in a way that could make it less fruitful for those sorts of, of conversations. Yeah, I would just say one other dynamic that might be a saving grace in all of this is sort of the, the benefits of real politique in the wider region. Um, so the India-Pakistan dispute over water is one thing, but the Indus isn't the only river system in the region and not the only country or countries where this is an open question. Um, so the India, Nepal, Bangladesh series of relationships, as well as the India-China one, uh, also have outstanding questions about shared water use. Um, so if you're sitting from the Indian perspective, I think you'd have to be cautious about setting a precedent where you're too aggressive about cutting off water access in a crisis because you don't want Beijing to use that as a pretext when they have a bone to pick with you. And that also gets to sort of a larger sense about India's presence in the world writ large, you know, abrogating the Indus Waters Treaty would be um, sort of a, a stunning act of unilateralism by the Indian side, and it's not really been in their diplomatic tradition to act quite that starkly. I mean, they look after their own interests, but this would be fairly brazen on on their part, especially given Pakistan's sort of, um, you know, their sort of benefactors and who have strong interests in making sure that that isn't the case. So that might be something that provides a way out of all of this, but it's incredibly complex regional 
diplomacy and under normal circumstances, it would be a place where the United States could step in and, and try to get people talking about this behind the scenes in a way that might be constructive. But I don't think we are living in a circumstance where that kind of diplomacy is high on the, the U.S. sort of priority list. Yeah, I'm glad you mentioned the wider regional dynamics, Neil. I was actually in South Asia and Sri Lanka during the Balakot exchange um, this February, and I heard exactly that point from a couple of Pakistani analysts, um, just this confidence that the fact that China did have... Could um, you just say what the Balakot exchange is? Sure. So um, I guess going back to February 14th, um, there was an attack in... Indian administered Kashmir um, that killed about 40 Indian security forces. It was carried out um, or claimed at least by um, a group based in Pakistan called Jaish e Mohammed, um, which has carried out a number of similar attacks to this one over the, over the years. Um, there were about two weeks before a response came, and when it did, it was in the form of a cross-border airstrike into not just Kashmir, but uh, Pakistan territory proper. Um, and depending on which side uh, you believe, it either took out um, the Jaish e Mohammed headquarters or just did some minimal damage nearby. In response, um, Pakistan similarly launched a um, cross-border raid and um, did an airstrike within the Kashmir region. Um, in the process, an Indian pilot was downed and was actually captured by Pakistani forces um, and fortunately was um, unharmed and returned to India, which was kind of the off-ramp from conflict. Any number of those things could have gone differently um, and dangerously so. But this was obviously a fraught time. And it was in this context that an Indian state official, um, as Neil was alluding to, had mentioned wanting to kind of turn down um, the amount of transporter flow um, into Pakistan that would still be in alignment with the Indus Waters Treaty. So it would just be removing excess capacity that India had been allowing through. Um, but nonetheless, that certainly got the attention of analysts um, from Pakistan, who I was speaking with at the time. Uh, but they made exactly that point that the fact that China um, is the source of headwaters for a number of these key rivers throughout the region, um, that gave at least these particular analysts a bit of certainty um, or comfort that India would think twice before really trying to turn the screws given its own water vulnerabilities. The other regional piece I should mention as well is um, analysts in Pakistan are watching a dam that's being built with some Indian funding on the Kabul River in Afghanistan. I've seen differing reports in terms of what the actual impact would be um, on transborder water flows, but that's just another example of, of how complicated the regional water dynamics are given the, the cross-border rivers. Thank you for sharing the broader international relations associated with all of this. It's really complex and really interesting. And then all the tensions and the specific details and the stories that you're sharing, um, it's really overwhelming to hear and realize that these tensions could potentially, we're talking about two countries that have nuclear capabilities and they could easily escalate, is that the right word, easily, into a nuclear conflict. I'm sure given that we're coming together as part of this Council on Strategic Risks Working Group on Climate, Nuclear and Security Affairs, the whole purpose of this is to really think about what an escalation could look like. And when we all came together as part of this working group, we talked about experts outside of the nuclear field thought that the use of nuclear weapons was something to be concerned about, whereas those in the space thought it would be less likely. But because there's two sides to the story or two perspectives here, I'm curious to see what you both think. Neil? I mean, that's the $64,000 question is how, how delicate is the delicate balance of terror between these two countries and how reassured should we be that every time they've resorted to military force, it's been conventional. Um, I mean, my own bet on this would be to say that in the future, we're likely to see either the status quo or a more a slightly more aggressive status quo, but within the sphere of the non-nuclear. Because um, I think at the end of the day, 
both of the institutions within these countries that control these weapons, you know, still want to be there at the end of a conflict, regardless of how existential they see the other as a threat, we're still very much in a mindset of deterrence, that we want to have these weapons in case we need to use them, we'll keep them updated, we'll keep making them, um, we'll broaden the sort of move towards a nuclear triad and a second strike capability and all of these things that the, the nuclear experts tell us are important. But at the end of the day, we don't actually want to use these weapons. And so if we get into an escalatory situation, we know there's a spot at which we need to, we need to stop. Um, how confident any of us should be that that calculation will go smoothly is anybody's guess. I mean, I wouldn't be all that encouraged by it, but it's probably the best we're going to get out of the situation as it stands now. Yeah, I would agree. I think um, I think that that is exactly the question. And particularly what is worrying to me is what I would argue is is misplaced confidence on both sides that because they are, um, you know, there is this kind of his history and cultural affinity um, and a shared military pass under, um, you know, training at Sandhurst and, and the British system, there is, um, I think, a confidence on both sides that they understand each other. They understand kind of doctrines and they understand the, the very delicate dance that can go into these sorts of potentially escalatory scenarios. Um, what worries me, though, is we at the Stimson Center, um, the South Asia program, have run a number of simulations with different groups from India and Pakistan that look at exactly these dynamics. So how both sides understand one another's resolve, their red lines, their capabilities. And consistently, we have seen that there is a pretty dramatic mismatch um, and nonetheless confidence that that understanding exists. And so as soon as you have that mismatch in play, it opens the door for misunderstanding and potentially catastrophic misunderstanding. You know, I think I am encouraged by professionalism on both sides. And I think there is um, a trust that both sides are rational actors and knock on wood, fortunately, this hasn't happened yet, but given exactly what Neil was mentioning in terms of, for example, the development of tactical nuclear weapons, it just would become easier for something uncontrolled to start in the region. Right, doesn't it seem as though that they're bragging increasingly that they're moving towards a full triad of nuclear weapons delivery um, that they're able to launch by ground, air, sea? And so if this is being showcased on the world stage, what does that mean in terms of nuclear arms control? Or are they trying to, are they just, is it showmanship? Is it trying to, an arms race to match each other up and just to maintain that deterrence? Is that what's happening? Yeah, I think um, one of the key dynamics here to keep in mind is when it comes to strategic stability in South Asia, it's not just India and Pakistan that you have to be aware of. It's also the increasing role of China in the region. So thinking more in terms of Southern Asia rather than just South Asia. Um, in Delhi, when you visit with folks in think tanks or analysts, um, all eyes are on Beijing and the capabilities that Beijing brings to the table. Um, you hear a lot about India's modernization efforts, looking towards Beijing, trying to balance or deter Beijing. In turn, of course, those same modernization efforts are viewed in Pakistan as threatening and potentially escalatory. And you see what's developed is a strategic chain linking China, India, and Pakistan. And so I'm quite frankly pessimistic about the future of arms control in South Asia, given that broader um, dynamic within the region. And then so you brought up China as well um, and its role. So these countries are extremely proud of their capabilities. Um, it's been part of the global discourse. We see it in the international newscape. So what does that mean in terms of a 
national pride and technological sophistication? And what is the public sentiment on this subject? Is there trust across these different governments that their governments can lead the charge and run um, the nuclear race, win the race safely and securely, and then come out on top? What are, what are the dynamics there? Obviously, from in terms of Pakistan, but curious as to the wider um, regional Im- impacts here as well, India and China. I mean, I think I'm not an expert on sort of Pakistani or, or Indian public opinion on nuclear weapons specifically, but I'll say that I think both of their strategic and diplomatic cultures have been raised you know, since the advent of the Cold War in an international system that privileges nuclear weapon states. And if you have a nuclear weapon, you're on a different tier than a country that does not have one. And then if you have one and your neighbor has one, then you'd better have the best version of that. And that's something that it sort of inculcates the political culture, the strategic and military culture, and does, I think, filter down to public perception of both countries' roles in the world. When both countries did nuclear tests in 98, you know, they were wildly popular in in both countries. Nobody thought that this was the wrong thing to do. Everyone just felt naturally that, you know, this is a sign that we've arrived as, um, you know, in India's case, especially a world power, um, in Pakistan's case, um, as a power that can balance out India if it has to. And I think it's been that way since 1998, and it's probably going to continue that way um, for the foreseeable future. I would also expand that out even beyond the military space to civilian nuclear uses and nuclear energy. I think there is a great deal of public support, or at least there's not um, a very vocal community of critics. Um, And we've seen officials in Pakistan mention wanting to increase Pakistan's uh, reliance on civilian nuclear energy up to about 20% by 2030. We're seeing um, agreements between um, various Chinese companies and Pakistan to build more civilian nuclear reactors. And so particularly in the context of this broader conversation on the overlap between um, nuclear and climate risks, I think that is a key dynamic to also um, pick up on here that um, there are vulnerabilities already existing now um, in Pakistan on the civilian nuclear side. Um, and it sounds like that reliance will only increase in in the next decade. Yeah, and I'll just mention the same thing for the India context as well. It was an obsession of the U.S.-India bilateral relationship for a long time that there be cooperation on civil nuclear issues and that sort of fizzled out for a while for reasons that are peculiar to India's domestic regulatory environment. Um, But the desire to have um, a strong nuclear power base is still there. So we've talked about the security implications um, of developing out nuclear capabilities as well as energy implications and the need to have uh, the resources to combat climate change. Um, You made that case very clearly, Elizabeth, thank you for that. So what are we missing here to fully understand Pakistan's security environment? So we've covered civilian nuclear uses. What else is, we've talked about climate trends, we've talked about nuclear issues, obviously. Do we have a full understanding here on Pakistan? And then are we fully equipped here in the US to understand what needs to happen um, in terms of our relationship with the country and what we might do differently going forward. Sure. So I think a couple other key dynamics to keep in mind when it comes to Pakistan's um, security in the broader regional picture. Um, So first and foremost is the ongoing economic crisis in Pakistan, Um, a balance of payments crisis continues um, and Pakistan has had to seek outside sources of funding from China, from the Gulf countries. Um, It just signed an an IMF package. And so those pressures towards austerity on the domestic side are going to be increasing in the years to come. And I think um, 
we need to see all of these other kind of the military questions, the climate questions in the context of a limited space for economic investment right now um, in Pakistan. Pakistan's also under pressure from um, the Financial Action Task Force on the basis of its lack of effective action um, against issues like money laundering and um, support for militant organizations. Um, And so we've seen Pakistan actually take some positive steps towards cracking down on some of those groups that that Neil mentioned earlier and also um, that were responsible for um, what happened in both Pulwama and Balakot over this year or earlier this year. It remains to be seen how permanent those steps are going to be. Um, Similar actions have been taken in the past, but to the extent that that external pressure um, and the threat of potentially being blacklisted by FATF, um, that does seem to have spurred some action in the security realm in Pakistan, given that one of the the biggest points of friction between the U.S. and Pakistan and indeed the the broader international community in India has long been uh, Pakistan's tolerance for support for, depending on your perspective, of these militant organizations that have carried out attacks um, in India and elsewhere. And so I think going forward, that is certainly going to be one area to watch um, that could have broader implications. Great, thank you. I'm going to ask you the same question, Neil. Are we well equipped to address U.S. interests regarding Pakistan? I mean, we'll see, you know, uh, Prime Minister Khan is meant to come to D.C. at the end of this month to see President Trump about all the issues that Elizabeth mentioned. Trump's instinct uh, in this realm has been to crack down on the Pakistanis as as hard as possible. It remains to be seen what exactly that will get him other than perhaps pushing Pakistan even deeper into China's orbit, which is will be a strategic problem for India and a strategic problem for the United States if you take the Indo-Pacific strategy seriously. So it's an open question, I think, and you know Elizabeth knows this better than anybody else. You know, policymakers in DC go through a cycle of being extremely interested in what's going on in Pakistan and then becoming frustrated and disillusioned and then stepping away from it. And then coming back in five to seven years, whenever there's another crisis, um, and it's been that way for the better part of 50 years, uh, I don't think that dynamic is going to change anytime soon, even with two wild cards at the at the top of both countries like Trump and, and Khan. <laughs> That's a lot of food for thought for our listeners. We are in the final few minutes, and I'm going to ask both of you to just give your any final thoughts or anything that you would like to really ensure is taken away by those who are listening to this podcast. What is the one key message you want you would want listeners to take away from this? Yeah, I think that all of these issues are getting worse by the day and that we're not well equipped to deal with them here in, in DC um, for reasons that are probably evident to, to all of us. And they're not well equipped to deal with them in Islamabad or, or Delhi. Um, so it's going to be I think a few more years of really bad headlines about water insecurity and crop failures and extreme weather events um, before anybody pays this the the due attention that's needed. Elizabeth, maybe a little more positive. (laughs) I'll see what I can do. Um, Maybe it's the the former diplomat in me, but I really do think that all of these issues we've been speaking about today highlight the need for dialogue, um, full stop, that if we don't understand uh, perspectives from Islamabad, from Delhi, from you know elsewhere in both countries, um, we're not gonna be able to work together in a way that will be required um, to mitigate some of these risks going forward. And as I was mentioning, even though this is potentially uh, you know, less than even odds, we shall say. Um, I think there is a great moment of opportunity here for both India and Pakistan to carve out some space where they can talk about climate related issues that impact them both um, and that are a little bit less politically sensitive. And ideally for that dialogue to grow into something that, um, that might touch on more of the security space. I like that. Thank you. Well, so we start 
discourse right here. We've had this conversation. We're sharing it with listeners. Thank you both so much for sharing your thoughts um, and your expertise. Extremely valuable. Thank you for doing the work that you do and for being the first podcast for the Council on Strategic Risk. So thank you to you both, Elizabeth and Neil. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. Thanks very much.